Hi, I'm John Black. I'm the CEO of Aldebaran Resources. We're a junior exploration company listed on the Venture Exchange in Canada. We specialize in identifying projects that can be very large copper deposits, capturing those when the market's down, drilling them out, de-risking them through approximately pre-feasibility stage, and then ideally being in a position to present that project to major mining companies that would like to acquire them. That's even more important right now as we see a, an emerging strong supply gap between copper uh, being produced versus the copper that's necessary to make this evolution to a more green economy moving forward. So we couldn't be more pleased than to be drilling out our Altar project in Argentina right now. I think we're on to a pretty exciting copper deposit right at the right time. Well, timing's everything in, in this game. Uh, gold market uh, going on a run, copper market going on a bit of a run uh, should be good news for you. Um, let's let's talk about that in a second. Um, I want to start because it's been a while since you've been on. It's been nearly a year since you've been on. Just as a sort of bigger new audience on here, I want to reintroduce them to you. So, can you just talk about uh, Argentina? Because obviously, uh, Melee's come in. Uh, some f- fun and games there. It seems from an outsider's point of view. What's it like actually doing business there now? Well, it's he's been very transparent and he's doing exactly what he told everyone he would do, and that's why they voted him into office. Is that things were not working economically in the country. They were spending more money than they, they had for forever. And he's come in and taking some, some rather drastic steps to right the ship on this. Um, we're pleased to see that the public is is in very good support of him. His, his popularity remaining, ratings are remaining strong. And keep in mind, he's asking people to take on a lot of hardship to get this, this, this changed around. A lot of people are, are losing jobs or seeing their uh, government subsidies taken away that gave them really cheap utilities and things like this. And so everybody's taking a little bit of uh, economic pain in an effort to try to get the economy reeled in. One of the principal things is to get that high inflation, just runaway inflation under control and more stable. And from our standpoint, the important thing is he's trying to create an environment that attracts large foreign investment to develop industries like the mining industry. Argentina has the same rocks as Chile some fantastic copper and gold deposits that just haven't been developed due to lack of sufficient capital, the type of capital that's necessary from large international companies to come in with the capital and the know-how. And he's creating an environment where that's much more attractive to us and they, they have a good chance of developing a major mining industry going forward. Yeah, I think it, I think in terms of new money coming in, foreign direct investment, we're going to still sit back and wait and see what happens. It's it's early days uh, with quite an aggressive uh, strategy there. But for the existing um, operators like yourself in country, um, what's he doing for you? What, what what does the culling of these various uh, ministries do? I mean, the Ministry of Mines has that been affected? It's pretty much just as strong as ever. Right? He's putting good professional people in there. They clearly see what it is we want to do. It's a fantastic place for it, and it has been before. This was not just a change overnight with Malay. We'd been trending in this direction for some time, particularly in provinces like San Juan where we work. Keep in mind that Argentina is a federation of states, so individual provinces have a lot of autonomy to set the tone. So there are provinces that are very pro uh, foreign investment, pro mining, and others that are not not so much that way. So we're fortunate we're in a good spot. But in San Juan, we're at this past field season. There have been more than 65 drill rigs uh, active on, on our project and a number of other projects nearby. Um, lots of activity. To me, it's one of the the real hot spots for porphyry copper exploration in the world right now. And that's because they're they're allowing us to work, they're allowing us to move forward. Um, some immediate things that have happened with Malay is it's he's taking steps to make it easier for us to import materials we meet we need. In past campaigns we've struggled to complete the drilling we want to do because we can't get the quality parts we need in to, to replace. And that was partly COVID, but it continued afterwards and was had to do with importation, exportation rules in, in Argentina. Those are being improved already, and we see uh, a noticeable ability, uh, improvement in our ability for the drillers to get the parts in they need to be able to move more quickly. And it's um, this this field campaign's gone much better for us than previous campaigns. Right. Okay. Okay. Um, appreciate that kind of overview of, of the politics uh, of, of Argentina. Um, Let's let's talk about the project. Alta is the kind of the flagship. Um, again, remind people need to this what it is that you picked up from uh, Sabanye. So we have an option to earn an eighty percent interest in the project from Sabanye. It was a large porphyry copper system. It was already known and partially drilled out. 
as a system. Didn't really fit in Sabagne Stillwater as a predominantly platinum producer. And we arrived at an agreement with them where we can earn an 80% interest in the project by cash payments and, and working into the project. We do now own 60% of the project. And by the end of this calendar year, we project we'll cross the, the required um, investments to be able to go to that 80%, at which point it'll be an 80-20 joint venture. So as I mentioned, it's already, it's already known as a large deposit. We have um, approximately 1.2 billion tons of porphyry copper style mineralization at, at just slightly less than a half percent copper per ton. And um, then there's an additional 200,000 tons in, in the inferred category. So altogether about 1.4 billion tons. That's a very large porphyry copper system already. But what we saw in the project was potential for there to be additional mineralization, and we hope better mineralization in the project. Our team over the last two years has identified a new zone. The, the known mineralization occurred in Altar Central and Altar East, two zones. And our team has now discovered the Altar United zone, which effectively unites the, the two zones together and makes it a large deposit. We've been drilling hard for two years now, and we are in a position that we'll be able to update the resource Later this year, we anticipate it'll be a very sizable increase in the in the reported mineralization. Right. Okay. So 8020 with Spanish still water. It's also moving a project, a big project like this forward. You, your your views. We take it through the PFS typically or traditionally, historically, because you you've been there and done this before. But someone looking at this thing, um, they, you're going to have to give them some sense of economics, and you're obviously working toward that after an updated resource. It's a very specific type of project. It's big, but it's also quite deep, and you know, although the grade is it kind of hits the, I guess, global average grade at the moment, it is deep. How do projects, how many companies out there will you be able to attract with a project like this in terms of scale, grade, depth, and 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 and, hope, and well, some understanding of the economics going forward? That's that's what we're actively working on right now, and so we do focus our work to be able to identify a project and present it in a way that it's attractive to a major company. Now, we, we wouldn't be making the investment and the hard work we're doing right now if we didn't think we were onto it. You have it on key points on this. Um, the majority of the project is average grade, which isn't, isn't necessarily bad, but it forces you to envision a large volume uh, and therefore large capital investment projects. So some of the things that we're working on right now is um, we just this past year, we entered into an agreement with Rio Tint, division of Rio Tinto called Rio Tinto Newton. And what we're exploring there is the possibility that um, we might be able to process the mineralization by heap leach technology. Um, fundamentally, in a large copper deposit, there are two major ways that you process mineralization. In the upper secondary mineralization or weathered mineralization near the surface, historically, in many deposits, that can be processed by heap leach. You just put it out on, on piles and trickle a sulfuric acid solution through it and produce cathode copper directly on site. Uh, so it's low capital costs, low cost to produce, a great way to approach projects that don't have the highest grade. Um, but the primary or unweathered mineralization has always required much more capital intensive milling concentration and sending things off to a smelter. Uh, not only capital intensive, but carbon intensive too as well. And so Rio Tinto has um, believed they've cracked the nut to be able to uh, to heat bleach the primary mineralization. So they've developed a series of proprietary technologies that they package into a group called Newton. And they've been entering into groups like ourselves to investigate whether that would allow the development of projects without having to build a concentrator and um, in, in a mill and sending sending the concentrate out to a smelter probably in Asia or somewhere else. So it, it has, it's a very attractive process both economically but particularly in the ESG sense, because it uses significantly less water, perhaps only a third of as much water as you would use in conventional milling and concentration. You use a lot less energy to produce a pound of copper. It's great now that copper is viewed as a green metal and a metal that's essential for us to be able to make the energy transition and use less carbon. Um, but mining copper can be carbon intensive. So that's why they're working on this. So we're investigating that. It's early days. We, we just started, just sent the samples off for that. But later this year, we'll have a good feel for whether that's a pathway forward. So we're not only are we defining the size of the deposit and looking for better grades and better way to economically line it up, but we're looking for technology that would allow us to not only more profitably process the material, 
but also do it in a much more responsible way that is is more acceptable socially to the the people that are living in the area where we're working. So we're pretty excited about that. We'll see. We don't need that technology to work to make the project go forward, but it could really open the project up and make it much more attractive. It's, it's, a, it's an interesting concept, and, and we've spoken to some of the other companies that um, they've they're also working with in terms of trying to see if they can make make it work, um, see if the economics are there indeed. Did you get any kind of financial consideration for doing this? We didn't on this one. It's actually, it's kind of a, a, a soft agreement with us. Uh, it's primarily because we, we have a sister company. Our same management company manages Regulus Resources where we have a, another really interesting copper gold project in northern Peru. And we've been working with Rio Tinto on that project for quite some time. So they have an equity position in our sister company, Regulus, and in a very established uh, relationship with us. On on this agreement, um, they've simply agreed at their cost to, to conduct tests on the project and see how it works. Keep in mind, they're working 50 kilometers to the north of us in Argentina on the Los Azules project of McEwen mining. So they're well established in the area. They are, are investigating very similar mineralization styles um, quite close to us. So this this is a, a, an agreement established primarily on a long-term relationship we have with them. Okay. So if it works, it works. If it doesn't, you're saying it's not it's not essential for what it you think. We go to conventional concentration right. and, and pursue directions that way. Yep. Ab- absolutely. Absolutely. So um, cause if, I, if I'm looking at this and you, I'm going, I'm looking at some of the um, drill holes and you're, you know, you're reporting um, holes from you know 200 meters down to you know well 1350 uh, meters. It's this is deep stuff. You get you know I, I guess I, I'd be interested in I'm saying you know when will we get a better understanding of the economics in terms of cutoff grades in terms of how you go about mining this thing in terms of those recoveries that metallurgy and recovery um, data because it you know from an outsider's perspective I'm looking in and going. That's got to be expensive. You're going down to you know 1,400 meters. That's quite deep. Do these projects work anywhere else? Well, so it's very similar, say, to you can look at Cerro Verde, Quebrada Blanca, a number of large projects that are very similar. Great for that matter, Cobre Panama as was mining an average rate of 0.3x on it. So it's it, but they do it by very large scales. You don't necessarily need to go to that immediately. You can you can walk your way into it. We have an, an upper zone that will be amenable to SXCW, so you could you could go low capex on that and bootstrap into a, a bigger complex going forward. There are a number of pathways. But to the the main part of your question on this is we'll we'll do the updated resource in approximately November of this year. Uh, we anticipate we'll we'll now be able to see the overall size of the system, and it it is very large and has a, an average grade. But within that, there are zones of higher grade, um, and some of those deeper zones do open the potential for underground block cave mining on it. It's early days. We have a lot of work to investigate that to determine if that's possible. The grades are um, sign- are similar to operations primarily in Australia that do operate on those type of grades. So we what we'll be doing is using that resource to prepare the first PEA in the first half of next year. Right now we're are, we're we're projecting that first half of the year, which is a pretty wide window, and that's primarily because we want to get those results from the new contest work in to determine if that's a pathway that will evaluate several pathways in the PEA, both in terms of which processing technique and also how much open pit, if we can do underground, some of the satellite zones, do they come into play or not? So it'll be the, the first real look at the various options and pathways that could go for. That's really what a PEA is for. And that, that'll that be a pretty um, key milestone in the project. So with, with funding that we have in hand right now, we can get through that resource update. And, um, and then by let's say June at the latest of next year, we'd like to have that PE out earlier if, if everything lines up and we can get it sooner, but it, um, it's best to, best to say first half of next year. So that, then, then I'll be able to answer your questions much, much more precisely at that point in time. I'm just, I'm just really expecting to be able to answer them. Is this, is, is this a, I'm cognizant of some of the questions that kind of get sent well, in and the conversations. Yep. Oh, and these are, these it, are great questions. It, we're, the same things we're asking and what we, we like our, it, like our audience to ask of us as well. So, Right. Okay. And then, so in in terms of your share price during what has been a very difficult period for 
uh, equities, junior equities, uh, last three years um, has held up really well. You've been to a slow, accretive growth. Um, you know, general trend is up, all, all good stuff. Um, you've got a share register which doesn't have much public float, you know, so whatever it's 20, 22% to a public float. Um, and with your, you know, three big shareholders in, in, in the shape of Savannah Stillwater, uh, you know, South 32 and Route 1, it, it, how does that surprise you? I mean, how, how did you manage that in, in a market where I think sort of general trend was, let's, you know, take 40%, 50%, 70% hits across the board? We've been fortunate. Um, as, as you mentioned, we have some very, very helpful strategic partners on the project. Savannah so Still, who water, water who we're running in with, and they're a significant shareholder. South 32 has come in on two different trenches over the last couple of years with strategic investments. And they, that's been fantastic. They've been making over market placements uh, without warrants attached to them. So it minimizes dilution to our current shareholders. It endorses the project. Uh, they provide great technical comments and advice on the project. They don't drive, we, we structure our agreements so that we're still in control of the project, but they've been outstanding partners for us. Route One, the large um, PE fund out of San Francisco, has been a great backer for us all all along. And provide keep in mind that these these the style of project we look for is big and requires a lot of drilling. So we it does require quite a bit of capital to be raised every year for us to move forward. So that can be challenging in tough markets like we've had, but we've been fortunate to have those strategic investors come in. Um, the 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 tiny float that we have on the company is is a double-edged sword it can be great it can be it can hurt you too and so we're we're fortunate that that many of our shareholders are are aligned they've seen that we've made a discovery and drilled it out and sold it to a major miner before and they've benefited from that and so they 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 can see where we're going and are for the most part aligned we don't have a lot of day traders on on our, our registry so so it's been it's we've been fortunate. It's not something we did by design. We we just the things have just lined up. I think it comes with us doing our work correctly and people realizing that. Right. And the, the I guess the other thing in terms of good fortune would be obviously we referenced it at the beginning. You know, uh, gold at twenty three hundred, um, copper sitting and above four fifty at the moment. That that obviously is great for now, and hopefully you know that situation you know. Is, gets better one one hypes and that's going to dramatically kind of i guess change the fortunes here because when we look when we when we sort of look at opportunities around around the globe you know low grade tends to not excite us at much because you know it doesn't leave much room for error but in a high price gold environment copper environment it you know covers up a multitude of sins i mean do you try and take advantage of it in some ways and say well actually perhaps now's a good time to raise some capital, maybe now's a good time to, you know, bring in a, a partner and get a, some kind of premium on the on the um, share price. I mean, h- how do you look at playing that? Because you, you're discussing all the options all of the time. So how do you play an environment like this? Well, there's, there's um, we, we can't predict where it's going to go. It's, but what we can do is recognize when things are happening. And so you're looking for certain conditions. Um, fundamentally, the deposit has to be there. And there, if you don't have a solid deposit, there, they, that that's the first step. But then once you have that deposit, you need the good partners to to make sure you have the funding to keep it. We've been fortunate that way, but we've been able to advance the project. Given that we're entering into what appears to be a, a, a super cycle, a period when we're likely anticipate higher metal prices, they're going up already. I think they will continue to go up, particularly for copper. Uh, it's time for us to move very quickly on the project. And it, um, we can we can make a discovery like this. We can have a fantastic project, but if the copper prices are down, um, chances are we won't attract someone to acquire it from us, and it'll be more difficult to raise capital. And so, when the copper price is up, we we the type of projects we look for don't need the higher copper price to be profitable. But what happens is when we have a higher copper price, the majors tend to get cashed up, and they they have extra cash, and they they get pushed to switch to growth mode and, and acquire things. And um, when when prices are low, they're watching their margin, they're returning dividends to shareholders, and they're not spending. They, they slash their expiration. They don't buy things. That's when they should be buying juniors, when, when the price is down, but they're not really allowed by their shareholders to do it at that time either. So when we hit these windows, 
the period of 2006 to 2011, 2012 at the latest was was a fantastic window when a number of groups like ourselves operating with this mode were able to sell assets to major mining companies with the exception of a of, of a brief divot due to the global financial crisis there. But that's when we sold our first discovery and a number of other projects were, were sold at that time. Um, since 2012 till now, there have been very few projects at this stage acquired by majors, but I think that's about to change. In the last two years, we've seen a lot of M&A activity in the copper space, but it's been primarily um, larger companies buying production, buying producing assets. And that's safer. That gives you immediate production. It's easier to calculate whether you're paying a fair, paying a fair price. They've felt that the prices of the target companies were low. That's changing. In the last, since 1st of March, literally almost every copper story has moved up strongly. So those those assets will become less attractive. We'll see if if BHP manages to get Anglo or who else enters into that fray right now, that may be one of the last last big ones on that. I anticipate what we'll start to see is groups moving into buying uh, production stage assets. And so it's important for us. We're early on this. We don't have a PEA. We, the, we, don't, we haven't de-risked the project for many of the, the same reasons you pointed out. Those are the same questions a major miner would ask us right now. So we, we have to work as hard as we can in the next year or two. To, to answer those questions and present what the project could be like to, to go forward. So it um so that that's that's where we're at. I think we're really hitting the hitting the sweet spot and we, we have to put the accelerator down and make sure we're delivering a project while groups are looking to acquire these type of projects. Right. So so it's almost about the money that you've got now and you know that allocation of capital because you're you're moving into that phase where there will be a PEA okay. which Part of that's market facing, and part of that's got to be given that you're, you're you know you're kind of the end of the the track there for you as a delivery of a PFS. So you're going to have to talk to the market and talk to industry and say, look, we've got we've got something quite good here, and at the yeah. same time, you know, make sure that your 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 shareholders or the, the, what, what retail there is um, gets excited about this and maybe does something for you in terms of that liquidity. And um, so with the allocation of that capital, you're going to do some more drilling for sure. Maybe look at higher, higher grades. Maybe look at because you, in terms of the uh, M and I, it's quite high already. In terms of engineering studies, um, and try to you know helping try to understand how do you maximise the the look and feel of the the economics and of course the eternal the eternal um, environmental and, and, and social component as well. So, what does that look like in the next twelve months? Well, we're just finishing. I keep in mind it's South America, so it's the, the snow is already flying. We're headed headed towards winter down there right now. So we're just finishing a twenty thousand meter program. Uh, it's it's gone very well. We're on on literally the last hole right now. Uh, we have quite a few drill holes to report over the next weeks and, and months um, as as we report the remainder of the drilling from this year. So stay tuned. Stay tuned for that. Um, we'll be planning what next field season looks like. We know we'll be doing that resource update. In the, in the latter part of the year, and that will lead to the PA in the first half of next year. But we'll also have next field campaign, which kicks off in September, October, and we will need to raise additional capital for that. We anticipate we'll have strong support from our strategic shareholders, but um, we're kind of maxed on those strategic shareholders. Moving another company in or, or something gets a little bit complicated on the dance cards. So more than likely, we would be looking for for open market placement for a portion of that. And um, f- quite fortunately, we are seeing um, financings being done in our space now. We're, and we're seeing a lot more interest in, in you can call them forward-facing commodities or energy transition metals, or there are a number of different names. Basically, the metals that are fundamental for us to, to move to a less carbon-intensive society. And, and copper is just, just the, the, the real the real key metal in that no matter no matter what battery type you use you're still transmitting electricity with copper and as an industry we're not going to be able to produce enough copper um i think many people have heard the projections in the next 20 years we'll use as much copper as we've used throughout history until today if if countries meet their their target goals for reduction of carbon so that that will result in higher copper prices because we're just it just takes a while for us to to identify projects and get them into production. All of the M and A that's been happening is just buying producing assets. It doesn't make new copper; it just changes ownership. 
we, as an industry, we need to start putting some new projects online. Great phrase. I've not heard anyone phrase put it like that. You're, you're right. It's the yeah, moving the moving the cars around on on, or on the deck. It's uh, it doesn't really change much. Um, they, they don't, and I think the other thing is obviously the it's getting harder and harder to actually build mines um, out there and longer and longer to do it, even if you can. So, um, like John, um, great run through you and appreciate the update on where you guys are at. Um, I'm intrigued to see what you guys are able to do in the next 12 months uh, in, in in a market which hopefully. Yep. Is remains buoyant. We'll keep keep an eye out for good news flow coming right right away. Really on things, we will have an investor day in Toronto on May 29th, um, and it's designed to be a deeper dive. It, it, but we'll have several of us from the company talking about everything from technical details of the project, what our PEA process will look like, uh, what's going on politically in the country, and that will be uh, in in person by invitation at the TSX offices in, in Toronto, but also uh, webcast and, and available for replay. So that'll be a great point to, for people to take a look at. There's also quite a bit on our website. Kevin Heather, our chief geologic officer, does some some nice little webinars after each news release to give better context of, of the information we're putting out. So recommend people take a look at that and and then call us with any questions you might have about us or, or the copper industry in general. We're always happy to talk about this space. 